Hi, my name is Dr. Kelly Piggott, and I'm the professor for this course on the survey of the New Testament. I'm really excited that you are here. We're going to have a lot of fun this semester learning about perhaps one of the most influential books uh, in Western civilization, the Bible, in particular, the New Testament. Um, now, a couple of things about this book. One, um, the Bible, or in Latin, Biblios, actually, as the name suggests, uh, is a library. Uh, it's not just uh, one book, but it's a collection of books that was written by many different authors over a long period of time. And in the case of the New Testament, we're talking about uh, a century um, that took place while, this, while these books were being written. Um, the other thing that's important for us to understand is obviously it was written uh, in a different culture, a different time, and a different language. If you look at the screen there on the right, uh, you'll see Greek. And um, notice how close all the words are uh, together. So uh, what happened was uh, some 2,000 years ago, you had some men who sat down and wrote these books. And when they did, they weren't thinking to themselves, uh, I'm going to write the Bible. Uh, they were actually writing these books in response to something that was going on at that moment. And um, obviously the things that they wrote down, they were quite passionate about. So uh, one of the strengths that I want to bring to this course is my area of expertise is in church history. So we're going to take a church historian's uh, view of the New Testament because I think understanding the context uh, out of which these books were written is invaluable in helping us to understand what these texts were all about and what the authors were originally uh, trying to uh, say to the people back then and uh, quite frankly to us today as well. So we're going to take a, a look at, at these books from a historian's uh, perspective and um, over the course of the semester uh, we're going to learn about these events we're going to learn about these individuals. Uh, we're going to learn about the context out of which uh, these books uh, were written. And obviously, we're going to study the books themselves and uh, see what they have to say to us. So uh, let's begin, shall we? Now, our story is actually going to begin some 600 years before the birth of Jesus, when a very traumatic event took place in the past history of the Jews. Uh, it was the destruction of Jerusalem in 587-586 BCE. Um, imagine what uh, it would be like for us here in the United States if there was a generation who experienced uh, the United States being conquered by uh, another nation, uh, who experienced watching some of our beloved buildings in Washington, D.C., all destroy the, the White House, the Capitol building, many of our monuments like the Washington and the Lincoln Memorial. Um, as you can imagine, this would be really traumatic, and we would remember that for a long, long time. This was the case for the Jews as well. When Jerusalem was destroyed, it deeply, deeply uh, affected uh, the Jews and uh, their memories and their culture. Um, and it's going to lay down a foundation for a hope that will be the basis for the narratives in the New Testament. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem uh, was so traumatic that you find many uh, books uh, in the Old Testament dedicated to describing what happened, uh, warning about it about to happen, and then, of course, uh, the events that took place uh, after it happened as well, where uh, there was a hope that God would bring Israel back. Here you see, for example, a picture of the prophet Jeremiah weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem, which uh, in his book he had prophesied. Um, now, Jerusalem uh, is going to be destroyed because of this man, a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, who was um, the king in Babylon. And uh, truth of the matter is, uh, you had several in the Davidic uh, dynasty, several of these kings who came from King David uh, toward the end of the dynasty, who were um, being a bit cantankerous. They were revolting against the Babylonians. And uh, at one point, they 
stopped sending tribute to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, of course, Nebuchadnezzar um, decided to teach them a lesson. And so uh, he is going to lay siege against Jerusalem. Uh, and this is going to wind up uh, destroying the city. And he's going to put to death uh, the last king of, uh, of the Davidic dynasty. Um, now, uh, when this happened, the temple was destroyed. And this was the temple that Solomon had built. And it was, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a source of pride for the Jews during this time. And uh, with the temple destroyed, the, the, the walls destroyed, the buildings destroyed, uh, it set up a period of time that was known as the Exile that took place from 586 to 538 BCE. And here you see a picture of uh, the inhabitants of Jerusalem being forced out. Um, many of them, uh, especially those who had any kind of wealth or power uh, or skills, were enslaved and uh, they were taken to Babylon where they were forced to, to serve the Babylonians. Uh, others who uh, weren't quite as important uh, were allowed to kind of scatter out into the countryside, but essentially Jerusalem itself is going to lay desolate during this entire time. Now, it's also going to be during this time, though, that uh, the Jews are going to do a lot of introspection about what happened and why did God, uh, of all things, allow um, not only Jerusalem to be destroyed, uh, but the temple to be destroyed as well. And so uh, without a city, without a temple, the only thing that the Jews had really uh, were their writings and memories of past events and their culture. And so while in exile, they worked very, very hard at um, preserving all of that. It's during this time that the Israelites will first be called Jews. Now, this is because uh, at this time, there were only a couple of the tribes that survived all of this. Um, and they were the Judahites and uh, the Levites. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, they become known as Jews. And uh, these two will be the only tribes that will survive among all the tribes of Israel, this exile. The other important aspect that will shape the Jews at this time, well, since will be since they didn't have a temple to worship in, they uh, started to focus on the law. And uh, they got serious now about um, what the law said, how the law was interpreted. And uh, during the exile, they took many of the books with them and um, worked very hard at preserving this their book, preserving their history. And uh, many of the texts that we have in the Old Testament uh, were edited and put together during this time to eventually uh, make up what we call today uh, the Old Testament. They uh, called it something else, obviously. Um, another important aspect of this time will be uh, purity. Uh, making sure that they uh, continue to practice the laws of clean and unclean that you read about uh, in the uh, book of Le Leviticus, for example. And then uh, finally, uh, their language is going to shift from Hebrew to Aramaic. Now, it's not that they didn't preserve Hebrew. They did. Hebrew, in fact, was the language that was spoken um, during worship when they returned. It's obviously the language that all their books were written in. So they preserved the Hebrew language. But when they're at home, just sitting around the dinner table, they're speaking Aramaic. And all of these things are going to become very, very important. In fact, you probably noticed uh, how some of these things will become themes that uh, will be spoken about in the New Testament. And it all traces back to this exile. The exile is uh, going to be, like I said, that that great, great trauma that will, um, on, on one end, um, make the Jews to do a, a great deal of introspection as they're trying to figure out uh, what they did to displease God that allowed all of this to happen. But then uh, also to look forward to God restoring Israel. And what would that mean to have Israel restored? 
Uh, and as you can imagine, as they are thinking about that, dreaming about that, it's at this time that we begin to have inklings of uh, a savior, uh, a Messiah, who God would raise up to restore Israel. Now, uh, what we need to understand is, as you can imagine, their hopes about this uh, during this time was very different from uh, what's going to take place in the New Testament uh, as uh, Jesus walks and talks. In fact, a, a big reason why Jesus had such a hard time convincing his followers that he was that Messiah is that he did not meet the expectation, expectations, I should say, that these Jews had developed during this time. As you can imagine, they're uh, feeling uh, like the Babylonians are very unjust and, in what they did, and um, they want some retribution. They want some uh, a wrath of God kind of stuff. And so as they're looking forward to a Messiah, they're wanting that Messiah to be um, like David, a general, uh, a good leader, uh, someone who can bring the nation back to her former glory. Um, and so a military leader is really uh, going to be at the center of the kind of Messiah that they are looking for. And as you can imagine, um, the exile is going to play a large part of that. Eventually, the Syrian Empire is going to fall and a new empire will rise. This is called the Persian period, and it will last from 538 to 334 BCE. Uh, this man, Cyrus, is responsible for the fall of the Assyrian Empire. And um, when he comes to power, one of the first things that he does is he allows uh, captives, and it wasn't just Jews who had been taken captives by the Babylonians, there are other um, nationalities as well, but he allowed uh, the, the captives to uh, return home. And so in 538 BCE, he issues a decree uh, that allowed, in particular, the Jews to return back to their homeland and to be freed from their slavery. And for this, the Jews actually called Cyrus uh, an anointed one. Now, here's the interesting thing about that phrase. Uh, in Hebrew, anointed one is Messiah. And so here uh, we begin to have um, one of the many layers that will be behind this concept of the Messiah that uh, the Jews will develop during this time. Uh, now, even though the Jews are allowed to go back home in 538 BCE, believe it or not, not many of them took Cyrus up on this. Uh, by now, we have a second, even third generation Jews um, growing up in uh, the big cities, so to speak. And, uh, you know, much like today, uh, I, I think there is an affinity for where the action is. So uh, many of these Jews decided, I've made a life here and I like it here and uh, all the good movies and uh, concerts are here or whatever. And because, you know, Jerusalem was just a rubble at this time. And uh, it was in, in an area that uh, was, for the most part, uh, uncivilized. So not many people went, uh, went back. It wasn't really until Nehemiah in 444 BCE that you begin to have a major uh, immigration back uh, to Jerusalem. And if you read the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra, for example, you'll read about uh, that story and how they rebuild the wall uh, of Jerusalem and they re rebuild the temple and uh, they begin to reinstitute uh, the worship of Yahweh uh, in the temple. Um, so temple life is brought back under Nehemiah and Ezra. Now, uh, even though you know, we have the beginnings of Israel coming back, uh, it is still a very far cry from what it used to be. And so now the push is to try to bring back the glory days of Israel. One of the things in particular that they don't like is the fact that even though they're allowed to go back, uh, they're still considered to be vassals of the Persians uh, to a large degree. Um, in addition, they have a, a struggle with the people who are 
uh, still there in the region. Uh, now, just because Jerusalem was destroyed, it doesn't mean that uh, it was uninhabited. Uh, truth of the matter is, there were uh, a large number of people who uh, resided there, and they were called Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans were made up of uh, people who were not taken into exile, remnants of uh, the northern uh, tribes that had you know, pretty much forgotten uh, their, uh, their roots, uh, and they had intermarried with uh, other cultures. And so um, because of this, the Jews who returned to Jerusalem under Nehemiah and Ezra are going to see the Samaritans as not being pure, because purity is going to be a big part of the message of Ezra. We need to keep uh, Jews pure. Now, this sounds racist, and in some respects it was. But um, at the heart of this, I think, was an attempt to try to preserve their culture, and they felt like uh, intermarrying with Samaritans would um, uh, uh, cause changes in their cultures that, um, that they didn't want to happen. So uh, purity as Jews, purity uh, in the way that they live according to the law, um, purity in their practices, this is going to become a very big deal. Uh, during this time period. So, uh, 587, we have the destruction of Jerusalem. Then you have the Babylonian exile, just to give you a big picture here. 538, the Edict of Cyrus. Uh, not really until 444 that we begin to have Nehemiah uh, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And then uh, Persian period, as you can see, lasts for, for quite a while. Uh, and then uh, a new empire... Uh, takes over, and this will be the Greeks. Uh, Alexander the Great will uh, defeat the last uh, Persian uh, emperor, and uh, when this happens, uh, a whole new culture is going to take over. In 332 BCE, Alexander the Great is going to conquer Jerusalem. And um, it wasn't much of a battle, really. Alexander the Great was a brilliant military tactician, and the Jews didn't put up much of a fight. But as you can imagine, um, nobody really likes uh, having their city conquered and having to live under the rule of someone else, especially someone from a different culture. And this is going to set up a period of tension uh, between the Jews and, um, at first, obviously, Alexander the Great, great, but then some of the later uh, Greek rulers that will come about. Now, when Alexander conquers the, the Middle East, uh, one of the things that he will popularize is Hellenism. Now, Hellenism is all things Greek. So think about Greek philosophy, Greek drama or plays, um, the Greek language. Um, in fact, the Greek language is known as Koine Greek, or common, sort of common language is what that meant. And the idea here was, is much like English is today, where no matter where you go in the world, people speak a little bit of, uh, of English, or at least know a few English words. This is what Greek was during this particular period. Uh, and certainly if you wanted, wanted to do business, you had to know Greek because that was the language of commerce and the language of trade. So um, Greek then becomes a, a second language for everybody that was widely known. Uh, now the Jews, I remember, are speaking Aramaic, uh, but now many of uh, the younger Jews uh, will learn Greek as well. And uh, so with Greek becoming so popular, you're going to have a group of Jewish scholars decide that it would be a good idea to translate um, texts that we uh, have in our Old Testament into the Greek language. And the book that they came up with when they did this is called the Septuagint. Now, the interesting story behind the Septuagint is that uh, they put 70 scholars together uh, in separate rooms and uh, gave them the task of translating the Hebrew into the Greek, which they did. And then when they got together and compared notes, they discovered that uh, miraculously all of the 
uh, the various translations were exactly the same. Uh, so this story uh, lent uh, some uh, credibility to the Septuagint in that it was viewed as a, sort of a, a miraculous book. Now, is this story true? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, it didn't happen that way, but uh, it is a story that gets attached to the book nonetheless. And so the Septuagint becomes... Um, now, obviously, it's not considered the Word of God because in the Jewish mind, God only speaks Hebrew, and if you don't speak Hebrew, then um, uh, you uh, aren't speaking the language of God. So if you really want to know what God says, you must read it in the Hebrew. But um, a, a close second to this is going to be the Septuagint. And especially for many of the younger Jews who do not um, know Hebrew quite as well, uh, the Septuagint is going to become um, what they know about um, the Old Testament, or what we call the, the Old Testament. Um, as a result of that, when we get into the New Testament era, it's important that you understand that when the writers are talking about the Bible, or when they talk about um, you know, the Word of God saying this or that, they are actually talking about the Septuagint. That was the Bible of the Jews, and it was the Bible of the Christians in the first century. So now we have uh, the beginning of the Greek period uh, with Alexander the Great, and it's going to last a while, uh, up until 164, when uh, you are finally going to have a group of Jews decide that they have had enough of Greek rule. And uh, this group was known as the Maccabees, a fairly large family. Um, and uh, as the story goes, there was a man by the name of Antiochus IV, who was a Greek ruler, who was forcing the Jews to become more civilized, at least in his mind. Um, and what he meant by that was uh, uh, to become more Greek. And so, um, you know, he did some things that the, that the Jews were quite upset about. Uh, for example, he built uh, gymnasiums, uh, which would be like health clubs today uh, for Jews to go and work out in, which, when you think about it, not a bad idea, but um, back then the Greeks, uh, the Greek men would work out in the, in the nude. Uh, they'd, they'd be naked. And um, the very modest Jews didn't like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, other things uh, that uh, were attempted is uh, obviously a Greek philosophy, uh, Greek theater uh, was sort of forced upon the Jews at this time. And when that wasn't enough, uh, then Antiochus began to uh, oppress the Jews in what they were doing. For example, he forbade circumcision. Uh, he forbade the observance of the Sabbath. Uh, he even forbade the, the reading of Scripture in, in public. And if that weren't bad enough, uh, one day Antiochus IV showed up with an entourage and they marched into the temple and uh, of all things they sacrificed a pig on the altar to Yahweh. Now, if you know anything about the laws of clean and unclean, pigs were unclean. And the Jews have been really upset just first of all about a pig being brought into the temple, but then if that weren't bad enough, a sacrifice on the sacred altar to Yahweh being a pig, and if that weren't be bad enough, uh, the sacrifice was not to Yahweh, it was to Zeus, uh, a Greek god. Uh, well, um, as you can imagine, uh, that was too much. And so a man by the name of Mattathias Maccabees decided that um, he was going to revolt. And so um, he led his sons to attack uh, the Greek uh, soldiers, and, um, and they killed a bunch of Greek soldiers. Um, they fled to the hills, and there they embarked upon what we might call um, guerrilla warfare whereby the Maccabees would hide up in the hills and then every now and then they would sneak down uh, where the Greeks were and conduct raids and harass them and eventually push them out of the area. Uh, and so as a result of all of this, the forced Hellenization of Antiochus didn't work. In fact, it backfired and it, it created a revolt whereby the Maccabeans 
were able to enjoy some semblance of independence under the patriarch Mattathias. Um, in 165 BCE, for example, Judas, one of Mattathias' sons, will win religious freedom for the Jews. And in 142 BCE, uh, two of his other sons, Jonathan and Simon, will win political independence so that the Jews are able to uh, rule themselves and they develop treaties with Antiochus and the Seleucids and the Ptolemies in Egypt. Now we have uh, the end of the Hasmonean dynasty, uh, which will take place uh, about a century after it establishes. Uh, but then in 63 BCE, a man by the name of Pompey, a Roman general, will march through Jerusalem, and uh, again, not much of a fight, uh, even though you see in this particular picture uh, some pretty gory uh, shots there at the bottom of the picture of uh, some of the Jews who were killed in the temple. Truth of the matter was um, the last Hasmonean uh, ruler cut a deal with the Romans where um, they allowed the Romans to come in and, uh, and to rule uh, over Jerusalem for certain concessions. Um, they pretty much, I think, saw the handwriting in the wall that the Roman Empire was growing and that this was an inevitability. And uh, plus two, uh, at the time, the Romans uh, were um, going up against the Egyptians and uh, the Jews didn't particularly like the Ptolemies in, in Egypt. And so they saw cutting a deal with the Romans as a way of uh, fending off the Egyptians. So uh, really wasn't much of a fight at all. It was more of an invitation that took place in Jerusalem. But nonetheless, Pompey is going to take over Jerusalem. Pompey is actually going to die in this very same year. And, and a new guy uh, you probably have heard of, Caesar Augustus, uh, is going to take over. And uh, Caesar Augustus is going to be the emperor of, uh, of the birth narratives of Jesus that we read about in the New Testament. Um, so it's the Roman period, finally, uh, that is going to lay down the cultural foundation for the New Testament. Now, even though um, the Jews were able to strike a, strike a special deal with the Romans that allowed them to continue to worship uh, as they uh, desired, in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and what this basically meant was they didn't have to add Yahweh to the Roman pantheon. Um, when the Romans conquered other nations, they forced them to place their gods uh, in the pantheon, pa pantheon of the Romans uh, as, a, um, uh, as a way of showing that the Roman gods were more powerful than theirs, because obviously these gods would be placed in the pantheon on a lesser level. But the Romans didn't require that of the Jews. The Jews were allowed to practice their monotheism. Um, the only th requirement was that they pray for the emperor, uh, which the Jews were, were willing to do. So what happened here then is that the Jews uh, were allowed a certain amount of, uh, of autonomy. Uh, they were allowed to rule themselves uh, to some degree uh, under this agreement, and they were allowed to worship uh, Yahweh uh, in the temple without having to make any changes like uh, other countries were forced to do. Um, but this was a tenuous um, relationship, as we're going to discover, because when we get into uh, the actual New Testament era, uh, we're going to discover that the Romans are going to start to uh, clamp down on the Jews, um, and the Jews are going to um, push back. And this is going to create uh, the political crisis out of which uh, Jesus will be born and crucified and resurrected, and but also out of which uh, the church will be born as well.